Good morning, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Okay. Um, I'm jumping on here full of allergies and puffy face, so I'm gonna give a rip. It's the morning. Um, I was reading this. I've actually been reading this over the past, like, three days or so, and, um, let me collect my things. It's in Romans 8, the Passion Translation, for the passionate ones, or those who need to become passionate, or those who need to be inspired, or have passion brought into their life because they can't attain it naturally, which is a thing, and that's okay. Okay. I'm going to read Romans 8, starting in verse 18. And I'll just read to the end of the chapter, because why not? I think that's where I started. Let me look. Yeah. Is that where I started? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Um, this has... Uh, starting in Romans, yeah, I just saw your question. Starting in Romans 8, verse 18. Um, this, it's just, it's just rocking my world because sometimes when you wait, yeah, I'm not even going to talk. I'm just going to read. Okay. I'm convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of the glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom compared, I mean, coming to God's children. I'm going to read that one more time because that was fumbly. But now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as if it were the contractions of labor for childbirth. And it's not just creation. We who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit also inwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. For this is the hope of our salvation. Okay, I'm going to stop here for a second. Because I read this and I was so inspired. So, uh, we who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit also inwardly grown as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. Um, there's a little excerpt, letter B, in reference to spirit. It says, the first fruits of the spirit would include the indwelling, it would include his indwelling presence, his gifts, his wisdom, and his transforming power. Imagine what the harvest the full harvest of the spirit will bring us. The Aramaic can be translated the awakening of the spirit. And that gives me pumped. The first fruits of the spirit would include his indwelling presence. So Christ within us, his gifts, his wisdom, and his transforming power. So then if you go back where it says, we groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. And then you relate that to his transforming power. It's pretty interesting. Uh, When I was reading this, I found it very fascinating that he follows up with this. But hope, but hope, means that we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. For why would we need to hope for something we already have? So because our hope is set on what is yet to be seen, we patiently keep on waiting for its fulfillment. Okay, so 
that's just in my head. I'm like, I don't think that's coincidence that what is followed up after this longing to be experiencing the full status, his wisdom, his gifts, his presence, his transforming power. I don't think it's coincidence that the idea of hope is what is directly following. Um, Because there are people that have waited and waited and waited for God to heal their bodies, for God to transform their marriage, for God to eliminate depression, rid them of depression. Um, There are so many people that are in a form of waiting, waiting for God's answer, um, waiting to see the fullness of exactly what it is that he came to bring. Um, But I love that it says, it goes straight from like, including our physical bodies being transformed right into hope because it knew, it's like Paul knew in the process of waiting for this full status that we are going to experience, in the process of waiting, there's times where we can become hopeless. Um, And so because our hope is set on what is yet to be seen, we patiently keep on waiting for its fulfillment. And in a similar way, verse 26, I love this. And in a similar, I just love that Paul speaks to the human condition so purely right there. And in a similar way, The Holy Spirit takes a hold of our human frailty to empower us in our weakness. For example, at times we don't even know how to pray or know the best things to ask for. But the Holy Spirit rises up within us to super intercede on our behalf, pleading with God with emotional sighs too deep for words. That's wild. That's wild. In a similar way, the Holy Spirit takes a hold of our human frailty, i.e. becoming hopeless, i.e. falling to the way of our our bodies, falling to the way of our human nature where we're stuck vying for wisdom, though he gives wisdom to those who ask. So don't, don't grow weary in doing good. But... While we're, while we're stuck in maybe what could be the tension of the flesh and the spirit and the carnal and the supernatural, don't fear, don't fret. Because he, the Holy Spirit, takes hold of our human, human frailty. It's not even something we strive for. He takes hold of our human frailty to empower us in our weakness. He groans on our behalf. We don't know how to pray, but then he, he knows what's best to ask for. And then in verse 27, and I don't know if anybody's ever walked through emotional sighs, but the fact that he knows how to plead with God, plead to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. There are people that have experienced pain that's far beyond the pain I've even experienced. But I know what an emotional cry an emotional sigh is um verse 27 god i love this god the searcher of the heart knows fully our longings he knows who we are he knows what we need he knows the things that we toss and turn in bed at night he knows the way Our minds are wired. He knows the things that our spirits crave. He knows the things that our souls long for. God, the searcher of the heart, like he wants to get to know us. He wants to to understand the longings to do. God, the searcher of the heart, knows fully our longings, yet he also understands the desires of the spirit because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. Hold on one sec. Just hold on. God, the searcher of the heart, knows fully our longings, yet he also understands the desire of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us his holy ones in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. So I remember whenever I was um, 
in uh, when I was at home and sick and like asking God what his perfect will was that thing I feel like Christians can get really caught up there uh, because we think that like if we don't fulfill the will of God then we've ruined our unique making makeup whatever or we've ruined why God has put us on this earth but when you look at this God the searcher of the heart fully knows our longings yet he also understands the desires of the spirit like he has a way to see both but not only that not only does he have a way to see both to see where the Holy Spirit I I love this yet he also understands because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God So it's not just the fact that God knows, but it's the fact that the Holy Spirit is giving little messages because he passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny, wrapped up in longing, wrapped up in the longing of our heart. So I would always tell people, it's like the further in love with God I fell, the further in love with the Holy Spirit I fell, the more my heart became aligned with the plans that God had in motion. And we became synonymous, like the things that we desired were actually in harmony. Um, I love that. This is the proof. God, the searcher of our heart, knows fully our longings, yet he also understands the desires of the spirit. Why? Because the, the spirit passionately pleads before God for us. Like the Holy Spirit's like, this is my friend. Let me introduce you. I'm going to tell God about the things that she's wired for. As if God doesn't know, but I, I just think that it's sweet that we're brought in on this divine trio in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. So when you think about the will of God and our human nature to screw it up, it's kind of, it might not actually be as possible as we think it is. So we are convinced that, this is verse 28, so we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives, for we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. For God knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share his, to share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest among the vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. That's amazing. Having determined our destiny ahead of time, he called us to himself and transferred his perfect righteousness to everyone he called. And those who possess his perfect righteousness, he co-glorified with his son. If you're having a bad day, man, read this. Let's go back to verse 28. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives for we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. I love the way that that is translated because we often hear it in church as like, uh, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope in the future. Is that that verse? Or is it, so we are convinced that every detail of our lives is contained in the love and defense. Yeah, God works all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's that one. But I love, the, just find yourself in the imagery. We are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven. Like think of a blanket that's being woven. A grandmother who stays up throughout the night to weave a blanket for the grandchild that's on its way, you know? We are continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan. That perfect plan that was just mentioned in the verse before, the perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny becoming married. For he knew about us all along. Before we were born, he destined us from the beginning to share his likeness. To share the likeness of his son. I just love that. Verse 31. The triumph of God's love. So what does this all mean? 
If God has determined to stand with us, tell me, who then could ever stand against us? For God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his son. Now, I was having a conversation with someone not too long ago, and they talked about sharing in the pain of losing a child and realized, like, wait, God lost his child. We see that so carnally, like we see that happen in people's lives all the time where a parent loses a child. But to think that like, I've never considered that, that world thing, that human loss to be something that also God experienced. It's kind of wild. For he, God, has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his son. And since God freely offered him up as the sacrifice for all, he certainly won't withhold from us anything else he has to give. So when you're waiting, sometimes when I'm waiting, I think to myself, God's just silent. He's never going to answer. This is just a test. I'm like just being put in a test to see how long can I endure without the voice of God leading me. Like sometimes that happens and it's frustrating and I don't think it's true, but it's what my mind is telling me is true. But he certainly won't withhold from us anything else he has to give. So if you're longing for financial freedom, if you're longing for a shift in your family, if you're longing for a new career, if you're longing for an answer to questions in your body, he certainly won't withhold from us anything he has to give. And I know the things that he has to give. Search for it. Ask him, God, what do you have to give? Who then would dare to accuse those whom God has chosen in love to be his? God himself is the judge who has issued the final verdict over them. Not guilty. Who then is left to condemn us? Certainly not Jesus, the anointed one, for he gave his life for us. And even more than that, he has conquered death and is now risen, exalted and enthroned by God at his right hand. So how could he possibly condemn us for, since he is continually praying for our triumph? Go back to the Holy Spirit in verse, verses 26 through 27. He's pleading to God with emotional sighs too deep for words. God, the search of our heart knows fully our longing. Why? Because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and perfect destiny. Then you go over here and you say, oh, yeah, Jesus wouldn't condemn us. Why? How could he possibly condemn us since he is continually praying for our triumph? That's fascinating to me. Because we as the church can be so quick to condemn Yet Jesus, the one who is like moving on behalf of us, he doesn't do that. Why do we as a church feel that we have the ability to condemn others? And you know what? Yeah, no, I'm just going to leave that there. Who, else, who could ever separate us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish us to... Wait, for nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love toward us. Nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love toward us. Troubles, pressures, and problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. What about persecutions, deprivations, dangers, and death threats? I know about death threats. No, for they are all impotent to hinder omnipotent love. They are all impotent. Persecutions, deprivations, dangers, death threats, problems, pressures, troubles. Put that in the impotent category. What are they here for? To hinder omnipotent love. Even though it is written, all day long we face death threats for your sake, God. We are considered to be nothing more than sheep to be slaughtered. Yet even in the midst of all these things, we triumph over them all. For God has made us more than conquerors and has demonstrated love and his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. I haven't eaten yet, so sorry that I'm a little all over the place. His demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. So now I live with the confidence that there, wait, let's get back to that. His demonstrated love. That's, 
the cross. That's the cross. The cross towers over troubles, towers over press, pressures, tr tr trials, problems, persecutions, deprivations, dangers, and death threats. Why? Because he all experienced it leading up to the cross, and then he died on the cross. Therefore, that sacrificial love that he showed, he took on troubles, he took on pressures, he took on problems, he took on trials, he took on deprivations, he took on persecutions, he took on dangers, he took on death threats. Death threats. He actually experienced death. It wasn't just a threat, but then he was resurrected. So it became futile. Yet we are sitting here on earth threatened by something he already canceled out because he went to the fullest extent, experienced death, and then he actually overcame it. So why be, why be struck with fear? Why be, that's for me, why be ensnared to fear? Why feel fear over something he's already become victorious of? Our glorious victory over everything. 38. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels. There's something for you. Or dark rulers in the heavens. Let me read that one more time. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, or dark rulers in the heavens. Take that to your theology class, because that's a situation. There is nothing in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. That's amazing. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that can distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. Everybody have a good day. That's amazing.